If you're shopping for a CRM, you know the market is flooded with options. We've got an expert here today to help you ask the right questions on this episode of Closing Time. Thanks for tuning into Closing Time, the show for go-to-market leaders. My name is Chip House. I'm CMO at Insightly CRM. And today I'm super excited to be joined by Vanessa Hunt. Vanessa is an expert in CRM and she has over 20 years of experience in this field. Welcome, Vanessa. Great to meet you, Chip. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, it's super great to have you. And, you know, it's it's such a crowded space that we're in. You know, so Insightly has been in the CRM space about 11 years. And we're going to pull up a graphic here uh, onto the side of the video and show the G2 quadrant grid that shows all the different CRMs that they're tracking. And you can see it's quite a crowded space. You can hardly make heads or tails of who's in there. You know, thankfully, uh, we're happy that Insightly is in the upper right quadrant, you know, and so you can kind of make us out there as one of the one of the top leaders. But, you know, where does a buyer start to make sense of all this noise? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, actually. And one of the, the things I find is that most people come to me when they're, they're already confused. Um, so they've started out that journey looking for a CRM themselves. And, you know, it's just like going in a bookstore. It's full of books. You know, you've kind of got to tune into what you really need and what you're looking for, um, rather than just saying, I need a CRM. What shall I get? So one of the things I think that's a really good place to start is actually being really clear on your requirements before you start. So you get some kind of boundaries and constraints to where you should be looking. So you're not looking at the whole uh, landscape of CRMs, but you're able to already, you know, zone in on on those ones that are are really key to to your needs and your requirements. And, And that might be driven by the financial system that you've got or the uh, email client that you're using. So there might be some specific things that already help you limit the number of CRMs that you should be looking at. Right. So you're going to start out with a set of requirements. And, you know, I I don't know, I I would assume that you've worked with a lot of RFPs with different organizations as they're looking to to find a CRM. But, you know, what, what are some of the top things that you would be asking your client uh, as they're kind of building their requirements, yeah, it generally is generally driven by by team and also by what the the, the main pain points are. That that you know, I know it's a very uh, common common phrase, but you know, what are the things that are really causing you issues internally as a team working together, and what are the things that are really impacting your customers? Um, so so generally, it helps to start you know function by function. And, and predominantly, you'll find it's one particular department that are kind of leading the, the chase, if you like, for a CRM. So if they are really looking at, you know, improving lead generation, then obviously it'll be, they'll be looking at the marketing features first, predominantly. Um, other times it might be, you know, issues with customer service, not following up on contracts, maybe having lots of customers with complaints that they're trying to help um, alleviate or, or mitigate. Um, so they might come from one end of, 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 of those kind of features or or functions um, for CRM. Uh, But equally, it might be, you know, just general sales management, sales operations where they're struggling. So they need really powerful features, you know, at the heart of the CRM in the kind of pipeline and and, uh, deal and opportunity management. Uh, But equally, it could be a really niche feature or or just something like project management uh, that they need to add, or, or they might come for a CRM, but actually they need a membership management CRM. So looking for those kinds of flavors of CRM before you start is helpful too. That makes a ton of sense, whether you're in sales or, or CS. I mean, you're, you're building your need set around how you're going to interact with customers, what data do you need to track, um, what's your day-to-day function for supporting or prospecting into a set of customers. And so you've been doing this for about 20 years. Yeah. And so how has this changed? You know, how has your work changed mm-hmm. in the past several years and then especially in the last few kind of post COVID. Yeah, I think uh, so very at the very start of my career, um, I worked in a lot of call centers. So it was very much focused on, you know, high volumes, high transactions, high numbers of transactions. Um, Yeah, the whole the whole call center space, you know, big, big rollouts with hundreds and hundreds of users and, and very much driven about operational efficiencies. Um, And I think really over the years, 
you know, there, there was then a kind of a transformation where we saw, you know, it would be sales managers or sales leaders who would kind of lead the, you know, lead the chase for a CRM. Um, marketing would have their own tools and be working, you know, independently of, of sales and, and sales and marketing were quite separate. And then probably in the last, you know, five to eight years, you know, definitely seeing a, a merge, as you would hope, between sales and marketing teams working together and seeing, you know, that it's not just marketing, you know, chucking over a lead to sales and off they go, but actually, you know, focusing more on account account based man, account based marketing um, and really just working more together to, to get the best out of, of the data and the insights out of that data. And then there was always this kind of function of sales operations. Um, again, you know, typically in a large corporation, you'd have, you know, the sales team supported by people internally who do a lot of the data work. And actually, I think we're finding that, you know, sales salespeople are expected to do a lot more themselves, um, you know, with social media, uh, working online. And so the tools have become much more user friendly for salespeople who are perhaps less technical to, to use them. And then that's really also made a transformation. I think sales operations have has has really been re rebranded, I think, as RevOps recently. Um, and, and I think that kind of seeing sales ops not just as a supporting or a, a cost base, um, but seeing them as a revenue generating team um, has been a fundamental change. Um, so, you know, the lie of the land is much more interesting because actually people are collaborating more and teams are expecting to get data from one another. Um, so the value of that data is also so you know very high. Um, and then it then determines that we need to be working even more efficiently together to get the best out of, of, of the data we have. A lot of those are very positive things, right? Mm -hmm. When you think about the teams yeah. working together, they're looking for a more unified kind of platform where they can function together. Uh, across their organization. And also I 100% agree that ops has become a rev gen team, right? And, and so them having a vote as to the CRM selection uh, is, is critical. Um, so one of the things that sort of, as, as you were talking there, I was thinking more and more people have used a CRM in, in the past, you know, recently probably versus say 20 years ago, like people's experience with cloud CRMs was probably just not that high because they hadn't been around that long. Um, and so I would assume that that's pretty significantly different, but it, it makes me think about um, still about 30%, I would say of our business comes from companies, even in the mid market that are still on spreadsheets, right? They're still managing all their customer data on spreadsheets. So I'm kind of curious what kind of, you know, st stats you see on that, but also it's sort of two different buyers, right? It's it's two different need sets for those that are new to CRM moving from spread, spreadsheets and those that are very, very familiar in transferring data from a competitor and trying to optimize what they were doing before. Can you talk us through that? Yeah, I think I think um yeah, to your to your point, yeah, they're very they are quite different because people that use uh, Excel and use spreadsheets and are familiar with those, you know, they they, they really like the usability and the ease of use of Excel and the fact that you can have as many different things on one line as you like. Um, and, and that can work to a certain degree until you get to a size where, you know, you don't just have 10 or 20 transactions that you want to look at. You know, you've got hundreds or thousands or millions even. So part of it, I think, is due to just the scale of, of your business and, and your ambition for growth, where you, you kind of outgrow your, your spreadsheet. And then for those companies that are using, um, you know, something like a, an access database or an ACT database um, and have been doing so for many years, you know, they're actually pulled down by the performance of that database. It's become so huge over the years with all the transactions that, you know, they, they then have issues with, you know, it just not being fast enough and quick enough for them. And there's a concern about, you know, data loss, et cetera. Um, but then when you're moving from one system to another, the change in behavior is is almost you know much much bigger you know from excel excel to a crm you know is one step and and that's kind of doable but if you've already learned certain habits because you've had to wait you've had to work a certain way because of the way that that crm worked it's almost more difficult to unlearn those habits um but equally you're very clear on what you don't want your 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 new crm to do because maybe you had issues with your previous one so the requirements are much clearer, I would say, whereas it's a lot more, um, yeah, a lot more vague when you're moving from Excel to a CRM and you may not quite know 
why you're doing it because you don't yet see the value of all these different data structures and the fact that you can develop you know very sophisticated reports and analytics from that information but equally that it's in a way that makes sense to many people across the team and not just you know the financial team yeah i think some people that are on spreadsheets are just you know addicted to maybe the flexibility of it they can do whatever they want but also i don't think they really know what it's like to use a powerful CRM that, that is providing tasks and pipelines and workflows and um, uh, configure price quote or you know whatever those technologies are that just make go to market teams way more efficient. And so I want to I want to come back to something that you also talked about is the consolidation that's happened in the last several years as as more and more teams move to more of a platform approach to serve marketing, sales, customer service, ops across teams, and ideally with a single view of the customer, if you can have that, you know, I think that resonates because as Gartner says, a lot of companies have, you know, SaaS app, just like expansion, 50, 60, 70, 80 SaaS apps at their companies. And so what's, what's driving the consolidation and what do you think the benefits are and how do you guide buyers to, to, to find the right platform. Yeah, I think back to your point actually about about COVID. Um, you know, I think you know obviously there were there's been a big impact on the the budget that people have available for technology. Um, and rather than the internet that we said was going to change everything and people were going to work from home, uh, I think it was it was COVID really that that really changed things for us. And companies saw that they had to have that flexibility of having a hybrid workforce or you know, people working from home and therefore how integral the systems were to the business. Um, but alongside that, you know, that I think a lot of people recognize that there were lots of applications. You know, some people were using Zoom, some were using Teams, you know, and and actually forcing people, you know, as a team to use the same the same best of breed applications became more important. And then certainly with the economic climate now, you know, companies are questioning, well, what are we paying for? Um, what is the value that we're getting from these specific tools? And I think, frankly, frankly, it was just because people didn't know, you know, whereas now, you know, the, the conversation is much more open. Well, I use this for project management. I use Trello for this. So I use, you know, another tool. If every user has got one app that they've chosen for a particular reason, you know, they're, you know, in a team of 20, you could have 20 or 30 apps that are being used across the business and people just don't know the functionality of the CRM or the marketing tool that is being used where there could be some alignment or overlap. Um, so it's just coming back to being really clear about, well, how do we work? Why do we use the tools we use? And are we getting the best out of you know all of them? Or can we consolidate them into a lesser number, which then has a bigger impact on training and onboarding? Because, you know, users don't have to choose or don't have to learn how to use 20 apps. You know, they learn how to use five really well, um, for example. So so when I'm working with a business, I'm looking to see what, you know, again, what's at the heart of that business? What is it that makes them different? And what are their, you know, company competencies that they need technology to support to enable them to serve their customer better? So we'll switch gears here a little bit, but there's there's the old adage that I think you've probably heard where in, in the business space, nobody was ever fired for choosing IBM. And in the CRM space, I think you would say nobody was ever fired for choosing Salesforce. But the fact of the matter, you know, Salesforce probably isn't right for every company, for every specific need. It might be too large, too bloated, too expensive maybe for a lot of different companies. Um, and so... You know, how do you guide people past that decision who might be considering, hey, I feel like I'm just going to choose Salesforce because it seems like the obvious choice. How do you guide people to pick what's right for them and what are the main deciding factors? Yeah, I think no, I think that is important. I think, you know, there are certain platforms where, yeah, if, if, if resource is no issue, yeah, absolutely. You can do you can do anything and you know that you can make it work. Um, but yes, to, I think it's also important to consider the culture of, of an organization and also whether you plan on having an internal team to support that CRM or whether you're going to run with a, a partner or a supplier who's going to support you or whether you just want someone that you phone when you've got an issue. So it really depends on how hands-on you want to be with the CRM. And I think that's where 
you know, CRMs like Insightly, you know, are very, very neat because, you know, it's not it's not onerous to learn the admin side of, of using that CRM. And, you know, on the Salesforce side, you, you know, it, it helps to have somebody that's actually, you know, really got a role in the business and is really going to learn the ins and outs of, of administration of Salesforce. But if you're a company that's kind of in between, you you may not need somebody to have a full time admin role. So I think looking at the CRM, you know, how you're going to support it. And again, one of the reasons you pay higher license fees is because you get better support and you get better documentation. So Vanessa, you've done this for so long and worked with so many different companies. So I'm wondering if there's commonality to the errors you see companies make when they're selecting a CRM. So what would you say the top two mistakes are? Yeah, I think I think the first mistake would be just rushing without the right people involved. Um, so making sure that you've got, you know, your stakeholders from the outset is really, really important. Um, and sometimes that evolves, you know, company people leave a business, people join. Um, and so the, the selection process can take longer than you planned. So I think allowing for that time and allowing for, you know, the different teams that need to be involved is, is very important. Um, on the other hand, also going too slowly can be an issue. So once you have made your requirements very clear, um, and I use something called Moscow, it's, it's you know, used by business analysts, you know, must have, should have, could have, won't have, um, being able to define and prioritize your requirements um, and knowing absolutely, you know, where those boundaries are of what you do expect your CRM to do or not do, and then just getting on with it. Um, sometimes companies, you know, get, you, you can get distracted by, you know, what's going on in your business and all the reasons why you need to CRM um, are stopping you from actually getting on and doing the implementation. So having enough resource and manpower and being really clear about people's roles on that project team is also important. So, you know, have I got responsibility for making it happen or do I need to be executing and be in the team doing it? Um, that That's a very different kind of role. So not, not having too many chefs um, and, and decision makers, but equally, you know, the balance of making sure that you have got everybody's input, um, but they don't necessarily all need to be on the project team. So I, I think, moving fast enough to get the value quickly. And then the more that you learn allows you to then see what the other possibilities are from the CRM. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's an art rather than a science. <laughs> yeah, well, that's great advice from somebody who's done a number of these. So Vanessa, that's all we have time for today, but thank you for sharing your expertise with us. It's really been great having you. Thank you. It's been, yeah, really good to, to chat. So thanks very much for having me on the show. Oh, yeah, we've enjoyed it for sure. And thanks to all of you for tuning into Closing Time. Uh, remember to click like and subscribe by ticking the bell. And uh, that way you'll make sure you don't miss any episodes. And we'll see you next time.